Oh shit. Here we go again. Baldur's Gate 3 Solo Tactician looks really hard on paper. From encounters that take the enemy count up towards 20 versus 1, to bosses that can permanently stunlock you, or sometimes just outright one-shot you. Despite this, it turns out to be quite easy. This of course is due to all the insane builds that are possible in this game. You have monks that hit 12 times a turn, immortal tank builds with upwards to 50 AC, and of course, the absolute monstrous amount of damage that can be done by some builds in a single hit. But just how high is this damage amount? And is it high enough to beat the entire game? I wanted to at least give it a try. Here's my journey through Baldur's Gate 3 in a single hit. I decided to go with Sorcerer, as that gives us access to Chromatic Orb right from the start. A spell that if cast in its Thunder state has a huge 3 to 24 damage range. I went for 17 Charisma and 15 Constitution, which might seem a bit awkward, but we're going to bump them up to 18 and 16 respectively with our first feed. The rest I just put into Wisdom, but anything goes. We wake up, meet up with Lazel, and after kindly gifting us all her items, she decides to just take the short way out. The first encounter goes about as smooth as expected. We free Shadowheart, and she decides to join Lazel. Without any allies, we move on to the helm, shoot some enemies, and activate the transponder. We wake up on a beach and find some blue orbs just laying there. People really need to stop littering. Some more intellect devourers block our path, but thankfully there's this convenient patch of fire right next to them. If they were to just randomly decide to walk into it a bunch of times, it technically wouldn't be me hitting them, they would just be killing themselves. We sneak up on an unsuspecting thief and kill a dying mind flayer for our very first level up. We are immediately going to multiclass into cleric for the Tempest Domain subclass, and also make sure that we grab Create Water for later on. Being a cleric also makes us proficient in wearing heavy armor and lets us carry shields, giving our AC a very very needed boost from 10 to 17. Running past some weird purple portal that we definitely don't want to interact with, we come across some bandits. Two of them are standing right underneath a giant foundation block. This lets us take them out with a brutal amount of damage without actually starting a fight. We push the mage down a hole, now it's just us against the archer, and after what is a way above average amount of resets, we manage to take him out. Making our way to the grove, we find some goblins attacking. Since we can't really avoid having these allies, after eliminating the two closest goblins to us, all we have to do is sit back and provide some defense for them, as they slaughter all of the goblins for us. Although it does get considerably closer than expected at the end. Before progressing any further, I make sure to sell all my trash and pick up the Rain Dancer staff. It will let us use a level 1 version of Create Water every single short rest, basically saving us 3 level 1 spell slots. We make our way into the Tiefling hideout and speak to Mole, who wants our help stealing the Druid's sacred idol. By clicking Steal on the idol and teleporting to camp as soon as the idol leaves the pedestal, the Druids won't have enough time to react and therefore does not have time to get mad. So we can just leave camp and walk away with the idol as if nothing happened. We return the idol to Mole, and she gives us an extremely powerful ring called the Ring of Protection. Next up is the Blighted Village. We crit this sleeping bugbear, who gives us just enough XP to level up again. Here we get access to our channel divinity, which is Destructive Wrath. It can be used once every short rest, and lets us max out the damage of any one attack that deals either thunder or lightning damage. We get to try it out right away on this unsuspecting pair of goblins, and use Chromatic Orb to take out the rest. Here we also get to see the usefulness of Minor Illusion for the first time to gather up these goblins. Although, considering their reaction, I think they might be onto us. Scaring off a pack of goblins, we enter this windmill and find the speedy light feet. A pair of boots that gives us easy access to lightning charges at all times. A very nice source of extra damage if we ever lack just a little bit. We kill a couple more goblins along the way, before reaching the goblin camp. 
Now is probably a good time to talk about Thunder Wave, the undisputed MVP spell of this entire run. By far the easiest way to kill someone in one hit is by simply shoving him off a cliff. Thunder Wave, contrary to the normal shove ability, lets us hit multiple targets at once, allowing us to sometimes close out fights with very very high HP enemies that we normally wouldn't be able to touch at this stage of the game. Like for instance, the goblin bosses. We ignore Gut and Ragslin for now and head on over to Minthara. One of our henchmen is standing right next to this ledge. By pushing him down in view of this scrying eye, we start the combat encounter very far away from her. And after a lucky save on a hold person, she positions herself right over this rickety wooden bridge. We take care of a few stragglers that are still lurking around for some nice free experience before freeing Volo from his cage. As thanks, he gives us a nice long brain massage session and a very special new eye that gives us a permanent sea invisible in a 9 meter radius around us. Right next to Volo is this crazed servant of Leviathar. By letting him hit us a few times, he grants us her blessing, a pseudo permanent buff that grants us a plus 2 bonus to attack rolls whenever we drop below 50% HP. We also make sure to pay him back in full with a nice back massage of our own. Let's talk a bit about the wet debuff. Whenever an enemy becomes wet, they become weak to lightning and cold damage. While an enemy is weak to an element, they receive double damage from all sources of that type. Combining this with our channel divinity allows us to always hit a target for double the max damage of any spell we have that deals lightning damage. Right now that would be a level 2 chromatic orb for a grand total of 48 damage. Killing some more goblins, we move on to Priestess Gut. We tell her that we need her help and follow her to a secluded room away from everyone else. Minor Illusion comes in handy once again, and the simple push does the trick. After some more extremely satisfying goblin murdering, we get our 4th level. It's now time to go back into Sorcerer and pick up the Metamagic Twin spell. It lets us twin a single targeted spell on another nearby target, which doesn't help our overall one-shot potential, but it's still very helpful in clearing out multiple strong foes. Only Ragslin left now. It just so happens that his throne is located right next to this chasm, and he goes down just like the other two did. However, the fight with his goons is not going to be as easy. First attempt goes great as we get hold person and then immediately crit to death. Second time around, I managed to save the hold person, barely allowing me to live the turn. Thunder Wave, still carrying me, allows me to unalive two other goblins, and Chromatic Orb takes care of the rest. We sneak past this ogre, solve a really simple puzzle, and unlock the way down into the Underdark. Beelining over to this spot, we find Falar Aluv, an extremely useful sword with the ability Shriek. It makes any enemies in a small radius around us take 1-4 to four additional thunder damage from all sources. Spider Mama is next on the chopping block, and a quick thunder wave into this hole does her in. The enemy's HP totals is really going to start skyrocketing from here on out, so a certain elithid power is crucial in making this run at all possible. Seeing as we pushed all three goblin bosses off cliffs, their parasites are no longer obtainable, which only leaves one right here in the druid enclave, and another one over at a uh, easy fight. Pushing some horrors off a cliff and nuking a mushroom area, we make it to the arcane tower. After activating the elevator, we find Bernard, a not so friendly guardian. This tower is very very tall. And by luring Bernard over to the edge, we can push him off, and he doesn't die. Because of this, they all get a free whale on me, but thanks to this blur scroll, it all misses. Down goes the robot. And his friends are soon to follow. We kill some hyenas and their highly disfigured cousins, before coming across a burning building. By saving this lady, she gives us a spell sparkler, a very useful staff that gives us two lightning charges each time we deal damage with a spell or cantrip. We find some paladins that tell us they will reward us handsomely if we kill a certain devil for them. Of course, we instead just tell her to chill at camp, and upon returning, I get reminded why I should be playing paladin instead. So instead of speaking to them directly, I sneak up on this trader from behind and watch her from sneak. 
This doesn't trigger the others, allowing me to also eliminate his second ally before the fighting even starts. Anders is still gonna be a problem though. With his 57 HP, he's slightly too tanky for our normal 48 damage burst. Meaning that relying on the extra 8 damage from lightning charges will be mandatory. I flee and return to approach him normally. By some miracle he misses 3 smites in a row. But me being the greedy little shit that I am, try to push my luck even further and get humbled real quick. Second time around goes better. And it's time for the classic dash around and do nothing for 4 rounds. Apparently I just don't learn and almost died to a smite anyway because I forget to use shield once again. I go in for the kill and it turns out that I just didn't need to get lightning charges at all since I just crit him anyways. Now it's time to deal with flint and get the last parasite specimen that we need. This fight is extremely rough normally. As to be expected the two allies that we have basically die on the second turn. But they give us enough time to at least wet the enemies. This is a huge deal, as we can take out two of the gnolls per turn, and they still have to traverse a very big distance to actually get to us. This really means that the fight starts as a 3v1, not that bad at all. Flint has 110 HP, meaning that there's no feasible way for me to actually take him out without getting a crit. Luckily though, we have a few hold person scrolls at our disposal. We dodge some attacks from the final gnoll hunter, and take him out with a chromatic orb, Flint has such a high HP pool though that not even a crit will suffice in killing him. So yet again we have to dash for lightning charges before we can take him out for good. On Flint's corpse we find the parasite, finally unlocking Lock of the Far Realms. Once per long rest it allows us to change any successful attack roll that we make into a critical hit. This in combination with the duet debuff and destructive wrath allows us to not only hit for double the maximum damage of any lightning spell we have, but now 4 times the damage. I try it out on this unsuspecting gang member and she gives us just enough XP to level up yet again. We don't really get anything too special from this level up, but it does give us access to level 3 spell slots. Now allowing us to cast Lightning Bolt at level 3, pushing our maximum damage up from 96 to 128. We come across this giant monstrosity called Bullet. With his 162 HP, he is out of reach for us even with our newly acquired Lock of the Far Realms. But he just so happens to be nice enough to position himself right next to a cliff, and I'm sure by now you know what that means. We approach the Dwergar that are guarding the boat to the Grimforge, and immediately die before even getting our first turn. For some reason I decide that the best course of action is to leave our high ground and just run straight into all of the undeads. After somehow dodging almost every single undead blow, I get to find out that this fight isn't going to be as straightforward as I thought it was going to be. All of the reanimated corpses has something called Undead Fortitude. This lets them resurrect themselves the first time they die, so I had to rethink what I was going to do, and yet again the answer comes back to pushing them off ledges. But the final Dwergar aren't going to let me off easy. They start off by one-shotting me not once, but twice. But third time's the charm, and I get to take one of them out with a call lightning. Coles decides to position himself right next to a ledge, and the final one goes down to yet another call lightning. We take the boat over to the Grimforge and meet some Dwergar on the way there. They make a valiant effort to kill me during the first turn. Unfortunately for them, it's not enough, and the usual Thunder Wave takes them out. We arrive at the Grimforge, and after routinely pushing off a few Dwergar from cliffs, we pick up the heavy Splint Mold. We sneak past the ambushing Mephits, and take out a surprisingly durable Mithril Vein with a smoke bomb. Before leaving, I drink a fire resistance potion, and decide to confront the Mephits anyway. I use a lightning bolt scroll to take out the first five. And the remaining three go down to a thunder wave. I approach this lava elemental, who despite standing in literal lava, can still get wet. And he goes down to our 128 damage crit. Now it's time to deal with Grim, and I'm sure most of you already know about the Owlbear slam dunk. But to even get access to the owlbear form, we need level 6. 
And right now we're only halfway through level 5. So we leave Grim on the back burner for now. I go back and deal with Glot, whose HP total, sadly for him, is just below our max damage burst. We push some ogres off a cliff. Clear out what remains in the goblin camp. And start clearing out all the Dwergar next to Nier. Two of them easily die after being hold personed. And for some reason there's a very convenient chasm right here. So yet again I lure them over with Minor Illusion and take them out one by one. We clear the rubble for near. Who we then wet? Kite a bit. And then one shot, seeing as his HP total is also below 128. Another parasite collected. The gnomes thank us by doing whatever this is. Ungrateful, don't mistake me. And after pushing off two minotaurs from a cliff and taking out the whole cult of Kuatoa, we finally reach level 6 and get access to the owlbear form. Now it's time to go back and deal with Grim. It's important to remember to drink an elixir of the Colossus before starting the fight, as this will maximize how much our owlbear weighs. We pull the lever and out comes Grim. I start off by going a bit too close and get absolutely destroyed. Second time around I make sure to at least somewhat keep my distance and use Misty Step to leave the arena. Transform into an owlbear. And down goes Grim. Not feeling satisfied with the measly 624 damage I decided to do it again. Now that's more like it. Before leaving I make sure to create the adamantine splint armor. And then respect back into sorcerer cleric. The extra level in sorcerer gives us a feat, which we use for ability improvement. For one extra point in charisma and constitution. Next up, Auntie Ethel. Auntie Ethel is normally supposed to, when she gets to a certain HP threshold, stop the fight and offer you a very very nice reward that lets you get plus one into any stat you want. Sadly for us though, since we have to one-shot her, this is not gonna be available. I initiate the fight with the red caps by cleanly taking out two. And thanks to all the water that's around, they're basically permanently wet, so the other two fall shortly after. We follow Auntie Ethel down into her basement. Take care of a few unfortunate souls. And approach her for the final fight. I make sure that I activate Falar Aluv's Shriek before approaching her though. As per usual, she multiplies, but Shield being the absolute powerhouse it is makes every single clone miss. I drink a haste potion, put out the fire on Meirina's cage, and after saving a few hold persons and tanking through a couple opportunity attacks, we reach the real Auntie Ethel. I get hold person a few times, forcing a couple reloads. We need to do 145 damage in order to kill Auntie Ethel. Our chromatic orb deals 128 damage all by itself, so all we have to do is add 17 more. We achieve this through a combination of Falar Aloof's Shriek that I activated at the start of the fight, and lightning charges from our boots that I've been gathering by dashing. These two by themselves add an additional 36 damage. 164 damage later, the hag goes down. All that's left now in Act 1 is getting through the Githyanki, guarding the mountain pass. I start off with a hold person. 
We dodge a few arrows, and one of the Githyanki wastes her action surge on dashing, and then pieces out. This gives me the opportunity to wet and take out the two weaker ones. Making my way down to the other two, the Invis Githyanki misses three attacks in a row, and we get to wet them and take them both out with a 130 damage crit. And finally, we move back to the Grimforge and take the lift. Onwards to Act 2 it is. If you made it this far, I just want to sincerely thank you. Uh, I've been wanting to make some uh, YouTube content for a while now, but... Uh, I'm not really known where to start, but I think this is a start. I didn't know how hard it was to edit videos, this took so long. And it's not even good, it's not even well edited, it's not even well made, but I mean it's a start, you know. Um, and I had a blast doing it actually. Uh, so yeah, um, I don't know, I guess leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy it. <laughs> I don't know what you say in the outro. <laughs> I'll see you later for part 2, have a good one.